Hello everyone. Okay, training game time. Uh, got the game started with my buddy Thin White Duke 85. And I have the black pieces. And we have E4 on the board. So recently, I've been looking for a tricky response to E4. As I said in the recent video. And I have been playing the unusual and quite weird Jalalabad opening, um, which is like a variation on the Sicilian. Um, and it, it actually gambits this pawn, or appears to gambit this pawn straight away. Don't know if I want to do that now. Should we do it now? Let's do it. Okay, we're just going to do it for fun. Okay, so you could play the Sicilian first and then E4, sorry, E5, offering the pawn. Or you could just simply look like you're blundering by playing c5 and ignoring the hanging pawn. Uh, there are many responses to this. The, um, the one I'm playing is queen e7, if the knight takes. Which the computer doesn't like. I mean, the computer already says that I'm basically losing at this point in the game. However, your opponent has to know how to respond. Um... But I don't have loads and loads of, of theory yet. This is very common. Bishop to come out, completely natural move. Uh, I'm just going to play d6 now and defend these two. So it, it kind of looks a bit weird and funky, doesn't it? I mean, you, you're opening up your king. Um, however, you know, is white ever going to be able to play d4 now? Because we have good control over that square. Uh, we might have the knight coming out. Okay. So you, you always have to think, okay, if my opponent gets his knight there, well, right now he can't because my queen will get it, which is fine. If I move my knight out, though, it blocks the queen's defense of g5, then the knight might come in and target this square. So you always have to think about stuff like that. You can even play this move. Try to offer this bishop. Open up the f-file. That could be fun. I can also develop both of my knights, and also my bishop can come here. So let's proceed with this move, I think. This pawn is actually defended twice. So it's, it's actually quite surprising how few people go ahead and capture this pawn. So if, if you're like me and you're a bit weird and you're looking for a way to respond to the very, very common e4, which is the overwhelmingly most common uh, first move. Um, this might be something you want to look at. Okay, so let's um, develop with a... I could develop with a pin, but then I've, I've still got this idea as well. I've got two ideas for that bishop. Uh, don't want to invite this knight in. So yeah, I think the pin looks good right now. So I've got a nice light square diagonal here that maybe my queen might use at some point. Generally, a clever idea to pin this knight in particular, right, rather than this knight. I mean, you can pin this knight against the king sometimes, but the king wants to castle away anyway, so the pin could be broken in that way. Um, also, this knight is particularly important. It's, it's pinned now against the queen, very important piece, and also it's guarding the key square, h2. Or in the case of black, it'll be h7 from there. Okay. So this is all very kind of standard now. This is actually transposed into a closed Sicilian. With both knights out. Um, difference is that my opponent has a bishop here. Whereas I have a pawn. And I've got my bishop out. Okay, anyway. Until I've just woken up. <laughs> so, what are we going to do? I'm thinking now, prophylactic move h6. My opponent wants to... So, you know, if you were to play a whole game where your, your primary focus is frustrating your opponent's ideas, you probably wouldn't do too badly at that. Um... Really strong players, you, you have pretty much an equal mix of progressing your own plans and 
frustrating your opponents. Okay. Uh, so that's one idea is, is h6 now. It stops the knight coming in. Well, the knight's pinned anyway. But Duke wants to develop this bishop. And he can't go there and he can't go there. Uh, and that's just poor. As is that, really, because it's just it's looking at a, a pawn that's protected. So that's the natural square for that bishop to go to. So let's play h6 and prevent him from developing the bishop to that square. Another idea I've got is, is knight d4. Again, very kind of typical thematic idea. He probably wants to do the same, actually, as well. Because I've got these advanced pawns here, that is now an outpost. So maybe I should now be thinking about knight f6 if I, if I can play it on the next move to try and prevent that idea from white. So knight in here is threatening to capture on there and then queen can't recapture, it'll have to be the g-pawn. And if the g-pawn recaptures, we've opened up the king. Then my bishop can just quietly retire and we've got an opened up king. So that's the plan. He can't do the same to me because I don't have, I haven't developed my king's knight yet. But also because we just put a pawn there, preventing this whole idea. So it is in general quite a powerful move. Now what you might get is you might get the kick, in which case you've got a choice. You either retreat and abandon the pin Okay, hmm. So he's, he's now moved a developed piece a second time, but he's pinned my knight. Now, the way I read this is, okay, boo-hoo, I can't make play that move anymore, right? So I have to respond. Now, looking at my pawn structure, his this bishop can actually get through my pawns, right? It's so a light square bishop, and my central pawns are on dark squares, right? So this is a good bishop, right? This bishop is poor. He can't go there, or there, or there, without being eaten by pawns, and these two squares are rubbish, and he hasn't developed this pawn. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to kick the bishop and put the question to him, and say, okay, are you really threatening to take the knight? Okay, it appears you are, right? And this is fine for me, I'm, I'm okay. I've still got enough pawns on the king side to castle safely, get my king away. Right? Can't do it right now because I'm behind in development, but I have four pawns now in the center. So now at some point I might play d5, and if he takes, I take again. And look at the journey that this pawn has been on, right? B pawn has become a C pawn, has become a D pawn, and then I've got three on one, I've got two on one pawn advantage in the center, yeah? Still defended by the queen. So this is looking much, much better now. I'm happy with that. So if you find yourself in this situation where you've captured towards the center with either your B-pawn or your G-pawn, right? Um, but sometimes with these as well, then you, you should think about this idea about using it. Push another pawn to trade and then promote again. And really get that control over the middle of the board. I have to say, Duke is playing completely solid so far. Thin white Duke, if you can tell, I can't. Don't know if you can see from his uh, profile picture, is a uh, nickname of the British artist David Bowie. And actor, has to be said. Right. So yeah, he's been in some movies. Labyrinth, obviously. We're playing print, uh, King Jared. The Goblin King. Go back, Sarah. Okay, now this, this is actually playable now. But it undefends this pawn, right? If I do that and pawn takes, he's actually now got a rook looking at my e-pawn. Which we do not want. Okay, so how do we read the board now? Happy that I've got 
a big lump of old mid coal in the middle of the board here. I'm not happy that I'm behind on development, and I'm not happy that my king isn't castled. So the next question is, what do I do with these guys? Well, the bishop has one square, which looks kind of natural. And from there, he could come up here. One of these looks fine. It's also just shoring up this pawn here. Now, the knight can then still go to there. Or I might decide, would I be better off taking two moves and moving my knight to there? So which of these two squares is a better place for my knight? Well, the question then you have to ask is, well, where can it go from there? <laughs> So I'm kind of inclined to take the slow road, e7, g6, and then to here. Because that looks like a lovely place for my knight to be. It's looking at the g2 square. It's also looking here, which could be important, right? Because if I get a, like a queen or a, or a rook on the g-file pointing against the king, a knight here then can't be captured because it would be because the pawn is pinned. And it can come with check, and then if like king goes here, you can jump in there with a the fork and stuff like that. So let's take the long road with the knight. That's a slightly unusual move. I'm feeling a bit like my opponent's actually suffering from lack of space now. I've, I've had a lot of pawn activity. And my pawns are actually controlling a lot of useful squares here. Um, so I've got good control over the centre. Okay, I'm just going to carry on with the knight. Uh, do I want to put him there straight away? <coughs> Might mean my opponent trashes his last bishop. Or I could de develop my bishop maybe like to here. It's attacked by knight and bishop there, but defended by pawn and queen. Hmm. I think probably bishop e7 will be my next move, and then we'll see what my opponent does. Also, notice a really nice thing about this is it takes this square away from this knight. So that knight now cannot jump in there, which he would love to do. I'm thinking definitely bishop to here. And now comes the kicker. Now, notice, because I put my knight on here now, I can't really play this move, because then he's got g4 trapping the bishop. Now the question is, do I want to retreat? I'm just going to retreat. Let's keep keep pieces on the board. I did have to, to consider capturing the knight, then queen takes, which isn't bad. But there's no real, real advantage to it, excuse me. And now, I still have this idea at some point, taking out the pawn. So I still want to play this. Even bishop here, would, I mean, would h4 be any use? If knight takes, knight takes, that's okay. That pawn's kind of pinned. Might prompt him to push another pawn. Anytime you push a pawn that's your king's defender, um, you create potential problems. Not necessarily problems, <laughs> but potential weaknesses. If I put my knight there now, I've got two pieces on here. And I do really want to take out this, this knight here. Okay, let's just go ahead with the plan. First of all, I have to say, why did my opponent make that move? And all I can think is, his bishop's just out of squares. Because we did this, right? And that's not great. Um, he wants to connect his rooks, because he's a good boy and he's been studying his chess principles. Notice that we've got some undefended pawns here, so I should probably consider the idea of something like queen b6. Uh, 
And I'm not afraid of him throwing his pawns up this side of the board because my king isn't going there. Let's just develop the bishop like we were going to anyway. Knight here is now a distinct possibility. I, re I really want to remove this knight. That That is going to be key to whatever I do, really. Um, so knight there, knight takes, I've got bishop takes, defended by the queen. And sometimes it's okay not to castle. For example, as we've seen in a few games recently, if the, if the queens get swapped off early, or at any point where the queens get swapped off, your king actually wants to be more in the middle of the board rather than tucked away safely in the corner. At this point in the game, when most of the material is still on the board, you want your king tucked away safely in the corner. Right, it's easier to defend a corner. You've only got 90 degrees that your opponents can come at you. Right, In the middle of the board, your opponents have got 360 degrees where they can come at you. Interesting. Okay, so clearly he wants to bring his knight back to here. Okay, ideas include pushing in the centre. <coughs> However, he's got quite a lot of artillery in the centre. And he's got a queen and a rook lined up with my king right now. My king isn't safe. So I don't think it would be the most sensible kind of idea to start doing that. F5 is, is possibly playable. But maybe I should just castle my king first, get my rook on the F file, and then think about F5, even F4 ideas. If I can get in F4, then all his bits over here are just crushed. So I think if I play f5, okay, he's going to have to take, isn't he? Hmm. I've even got knight there, though. Quite like that idea. Knight there. Maybe then put my queen on the light square. Sack the bishop. Pawn takes. Queen takes. My knight's here. But then this knight is now defending that. That's kind of interesting too. Or we, we, let's also reconsider the d5, d4 push. Now if d5, there's only real option is to take the pawn. But then I can take with Charlie 1 or Charlie 2, Charlie 2, um, who was, used to be Barry, is now Charlie. Okay, take, take, take. That pawn is defended by the knight. All right, let's try this idea. Let's try this. One of my strengths in this game is this strong pawn center, this mass of pawns I've got. And you can see that my opponent's almost like in a straight jacket. It's like he can't move. His bishop can't go there, can't go there. If I get this move in, that bishop's redundant. Okay. Now, if we were to, let's flip the board. If I was white here, I am concerned that I've got bishops lined up towards my king side. I am concerned that there's this big pawn battery here. So what I might be thinking about is throwing these pawns up the board and trying to create some kind of counterplay. Right, bottom line, this bishop is terrible. Terrible, terrible. So something like this, you've got to open up the board. So white needs to be... Okay, so we've got a capture. Interesting. Right, so I'm going to... Ah, oh, if I take, it's undefended. Did I miscalculate that? Clearly. Okay. So if I take a knight takes, we've got an undefended knight there. 
I mean, so I could grab that pawn. Okay, let's try that. I've always been thinking about this anyway. That pawn's been hanging out there for a while. So if the knight takes now, right, I could grab that pawn. Then if he captures the bishop, I get the knight, so I've just won my pawn back. If he retreats the knight, I retreat my bishop, and I've eradicated h3. Seems all right. If he doesn't capture it, I'm inclined to push. Again, putting my pawns on dark squares, which again makes life very difficult for white's rem remaining bishop. Okay, so he's done that. Let's go for this idea. So now, in the space of just a few moves, the whole board has changed. I'm inclined to push f6, maybe at some point now. Reinforce this pawn, get a dark square pawn chain going on. I've got an isolated pawn now on the c-file. It's all kicking off. If takes, I'm having the knight, and the king has been cracked open. If the knight retreats, which can only really be to there or there, I suppose he, he also has the option of taking my dark square bishop, which I'm perfectly fine about. I'll recapture with the queen, adding a second defender to this. It doesn't really need a second defender because the queen isn't going to capture that pawn and trade her life for a for a knight. All right, so we've gone for that idea. Okay, all change now, all change. Everything is now different in the space of just a few moves, you see? And this is why, you know, I bang on about this. In the middle game, your idea is to um, improve your pieces, build up to an attack, and then you've always got this option to shake things up with the pawn break. And you go, oh, it's a, it's a pawn move. It's like pawn from here to one square. How can that make a difference? Well, look at this. Right, from here, I make this pawn break. Takes, 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 boom, boom. And the whole game is different. Right? That is, that's what we mean. That pawn breaks. Okay, now, my opponent's situation. First of all, let's look at pawn structure. Okay, solid, solid, solid. Where's the king? Over here, in all this space, right? Two isolated pawns. Um, and he's not moved his, potentially his attack pawns. I'm not, this is not necessarily criticism, just a statement of fact, right? These are his cheap pawns that he can throw up the board. These are his important pawns that are protecting his match, right? And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a proposed trade. I am disinclined to acquiesce to his request. Think that is the Pirates of the Caribbean. Please tell the captain I'm disinclined to acquiesce to his request. What? No. Uh, Barbeau's a great character, isn't it? Okay. Now, one thing I notice is that uh, he has one, two, three attackers on this pawn. Yeah, which he's had since this. Okay. So now there's three attackers on here. Big question is, do I want to trade off queens, right? Now, how do we make a decision on that? Um, stuff is kind of, material is equal. I have a safer king. My rooks are connected, so I'm not worried about moving the queen. My first thought is to move the queen here and have a, have a sniff around this pawn. Yeah. If he wants to take that with his knight, I might trade off knights, that's fine. No, I'm just gonna go ahead and do that, right? This is defended. Bishop's defended. I might play f6, but I'm not sure yet. I might play bishop there to defend the pawn. Might be a bit more flexible. Um, but that's my idea. That's my target here. So I'm keeping my queen on the board because I think that um, I have better attacking prospects than white does. <laughs> 
I notice he's got some hanging pieces. Um, I, in, on the other hand, don't really. Rooks are connected. Everything is actually defended right now on my side of the board. Okay, so while we've got that situation, I want my major attacking piece on the board. And when you're playing against a, a stronger player, it can make sense to simplify. I mean, I had a game recently, you know, with somebody several hundred points lower who beat me in a pawn pushing race in the end game. We got down to kings and pawns because he was just swapping, swapping, swapping everything off and simplifying the game as much as he could. And then um, he ended up just winning the, the, the king and pawn end game for technical reasons, right? And that stuff happens. I have actually got even f5 at some point here. f5 is not too shabby. Because it's defended by my queen and the rook, right? Okay, so we're going to trade knights. Queen has to recapture. <laughs> now, Black, uh, White's now got two attackers on that. So I'm going to... Which which rook? That's the question. Now that pawn's gone, I think pushing the f-pawn doesn't make so much sense. So I'm let's play... Hang on. Oh. Now slip. <laughs> Um, right, that was, that was an error that. Okay, so what we're saying is well, I want to put the rook here. Okay, so I'm going to now put my rook there. And now I can, so that, that's good. Good thing that you're playing with a buddy. Okay, so what I was about to say was I need to consider the threat of this bishop. It's quite seriously. Because I've also got a pawn hanging out on h6. So I need to be concerned about... Uh, maybe a bishop sack on, on there. So thing to watch out for, if a major piece, i.e. a rook or a queen, ever gets onto the g-file, that pawn is then undefended. If this pawn gets pinned, that pawn's undefended. So I might think about moving my king out of the way. I think this just looks like a generally good all-purpose move. Attacks the queen twice forces her to move. Also, X-ray attacking the B2 pawn, and therefore the rook behind it as well. So if I get to make that move, that would be quite good. However, it does actually undefend that... Ah! You see? What did I just... What did I just say? Huh. <sighs> okay, so, there's an immediate threat of checkmate. Okay, if I take the bishop... Does white have a winning attack? This is the question. I've also got f6. But if f6, right, let's he could just drop the queen back here onto the g-file, like we said, and I can't take the bishop. So this is a now or never situation. If I take the bish with a pawn, I've always got bishop to here. My queen is covering some squares. My bishop's actually covering all of this. My pawn will be covering that. So if I take the bishop, where's the queen going to go? Queen comes back here. Let, let's find out. I think I'm all right. I'm quite happy about this idea. Um, quite happy I can sidestep with my king. And then I've even got ideas of rook g1 check. 
Ah. Can you even just put my king here? So I think that that may be a case of premature attackulation from my opponent. Okay, so queen here. We expected that. Now, that is not really too clever because there's the op option of f4 or h4 attacking the pinned piece and winning the pinned piece. Then I'd really have to move my king out of the way. So I might as well bite the bullet, move the king out of the way now. So I'm thinking here or here. Because then the threat is rook g1, oh no, my queen, right? So I'm going to go on to the light square. The reason is because this queen now has no checking squares. Because she's on a dark square now. So she can go like here or here. But I'm on a light square, so it's no good. Right? She can go there, there, or there to check me. But she gets gobbled up. Either way. And there's a serious threat of rook g8. Which is winning. Right, I don't see any problem with this move now. And the pattern to look out for is my king and queen are in line in front of a whole load of fresh air. So you have to look out for major pieces, particularly rooks. And that's a shame because actually my opponent was, was having a really strong game up to that point. We're down on time. He's down under two minutes. I've got five minutes left, even though I've been doing a lot of this. But, uh, yeah, this is, this is just a, an example of one of those one-move blunders that you make, right? So after he put the queen here, okay, as soon as he does that, what you need to do is you need to think, Duke, if you're listening, yeah, I've put my king and my queen in line with each other, right? And, yeah, he's just put in the chat, I knew I should have moved out of that pin. Yes, absolutely should. And the king only has one square. Okay. I'm king bishop here now. So one idea is like rook here and then try and be fancy and with a discovered check. Um, that would actually be checkmate, I think. Or bishop here straight away blocking off these dark squares, and then drop the rook on there. It's kind of the same thing, really. But if I try and be fancy now, right, move, move my rook here, he's got the chance of his king to start running away. Then if I put my bishop there, king runs away to here, right? So I'm going to go for that move first. Then I think rookie eight is mate. So important as well to try and keep the, the exact same balance of um, attacking mentality and defensive mentality on every move, even when you get excited. And I think getting overexcited is, certainly for me, it's, it's one of my problems. You know, when I feel like, oh, this game is one. Do you know what the, the, the most obvious sign to me of I'm about to screw up really badly is when I start counting what my rating is going to be when I win the game. Right? If you ever find yourself doing that huge red flag, uh, it's checkmate. Brilliant. Good game. And Ed's been watching. Good game. Hey, Ed. All right. Uh, interesting one, that. So let's do a quick review because uh, this, this is fascinating. Okay, so... Um, in fact, let's review the game from White's perspective. E4, E5. All normal. Knight out, and then what sorcery is this? The Jalalabad variation? I can't even say it. Never mind, write it. Okay, so very natural. Very natural. Getting ready to castle. Let's put his bishop on the Italian square. We should call that the piazza, shouldn't we? The Italian square, c4. 
Okay. And um, black now reinforces. So if I was white at this point, I'd be s slightly tempted to think, am I about to make a punishing dumbass openings video? Okay. But it, it's actually a little more solid than it looks. Now, the first thing you have to notice is there's a lot of light squared fresh air. The dark squared bishops, both dark squared bishops are going to have trouble in this game. That's, that's how I would read it so far. Okay, knight out. Perfectly good. Maybe even thinking about making an early bid for d5. Seeing as the c-pawn and the e-pawn are already too far forward. Okay, knight out. Castles. Perfectly solid. Bishop out with a pin. Do we kick the bishop? Can we kick it? No, we don't. Okay. So d3 is a good move. Preparing to uh, deploy the dark squared bishop. Now, I think... Yeah, and this is the point where I spot that he wants to deploy the dark squared bishop and say, oh, no, you don't. You are not having g5. You are not going there, and you can't go there. Right? So frustrating your opponent's ideas can be very powerful. Right? It can even be more powerful than executing your own ideas. Now he makes a second bishop move. Pinning my knight. Excuse me. Not sniffly today, okay? I'm not sure about this move, really. I would say probably you're better off at least developing the final minor piece before you start thinking about prodding at your opponent. Because, well, let's see how it goes. So I decide to kick the bishop, or put the question to the bishop. The bishop says, yes, I, I, I do intend to capture the knight all along. That was my plan. And then I get to capture inwards towards the center. And now I've got this, this pawn structure. Okay, and now the knight doesn't have the opportunity for that. So here, maybe a better move might have been to jump the knight into there straight away. I think that probably could have been, yeah? Because I don't think... White, White has now lost his good bishop. Yeah? He's ended up with this crap one. That's got no, no prospects in life at all. And he's lost this square. And he's facing a heavy pawn majority in the middle. Okay. Now he centralises his rook. Okay. Notice, still haven't developed the final minor piece, but then look at Black's development. What Black's got in his favour is space. He's got all these advanced pawns taking away a lot of squares and controlling squares in White's territory. All right, that's pretty good. But White looks solid here. Okay, now, out comes the knight. Queen comes off the back rank. The knight manoeuvres round yet further. Now we kick the bishop, and the bishop retreats. Now we develop the final minor piece, connecting the rooks. And at this point, you have to say, actually, white's position looks pretty darn solid, right? The only chink is this advanced pawn. And also the fact that you can't get to there. I mean, these knights right now are two arms lengths away from the king. It's a, they can't hurt the king. They can't even threaten the king right now. And because of all this pawn activity, they can't even advance up the board. Right? They can't go there. There's very, very few prospects for these knights now. Um, and it all comes down to very small decisions, doesn't it? Okay, bishop develops. Knight starts to pivot round. Black castles, okay? So we've both got kings with a an advanced age pawn. Knight carries on pivoting round. Still at this point, you know, I would say, I mean, my opponent's rated 886. I would I would say I'm playing an 1100, at, you know, at this point for sure. Um, and now the, the pawn break in the middle, which I, I have to confess I didn't calculate properly, okay? And I've gone down a pawn but only temporarily because I have a discovered attack 
and I get to grab a pawn at the same time. Okay, so here we go. Um, knight's under attack, but my bishop is under attack. So he has a choice. Do I save my own knight and allow the bishop to get away? Or do I capture? He decides to capture, giving himself an isolated pawn and opening up the king. Right, so I grab his knight. Proposed trade of queens, not having it. Retreats, now attacking this. Okay. Now notice how in the, sh in the space of just a few turns, everything can turn on its head. And I think this weak isolated pawn here is significant. Black's king is suddenly, whereas for most of the game, up to this point, white's position looked very solid. Now it looks like it's black who has the safety. Okay. But as we see again, we, we're going to see the same move. We're going to see a bishop sack on h6. Okay, grabs a pawn. And we trade knights. Okay, so uh, white is still at one pawn at this point, but big downside is this exposed king now. All right? Notice the king would love to be over here, where all these pawns that haven't moved. All right? But it's not, it's over here in the sticks, uh, out on the plains. Okay, so this was a, an error, and then we have this. And now, boom. Now I like the idea, I like the thinking, but I don't think, but you know, he's got six, six minutes on the clock. He could have spent a minute on this. And we have a, a 10 second increment, right? Um, I don't think this was decisive. It's like the kind of attack that you do in Blitz rather than the kind of attack you do in Rapid, right? In Rapid, you should have time to figure this stuff out. And I've got my, my queen and my bishop covering a bunch of squares here. I've got a potential escape for the king, a couple of ways to get away, right? And I've got a very threatening rook. So at this point... If, if we say that that was, a, that was a rash move, what options does this white have? <sighs> One thing I'd, I'd be thinking about, I mean, he definitely wants to get his king to safety, actually. So there's a lot of space on the board now, and there's a rogue bishop flying around. So I, one priority, I think, for me at this point would be get this last rook into the game. So maybe something like rook e2, get this rook in or even try and get the rooks both of them off the back rank so that the king can you know scurry away here that's one idea um, could even maybe put the king here get a rook on here and then that becomes oh not that that becomes deadly okay so at this point he, queen g3 then threatens that grabbing that pawn and its defender is pinned and, and that would threaten main so I think that would be an idea Queen g3 something like that take advantage of this so I think this was a case of attacking without preparing first anyway so we have Bishop takes pawn takes and now the Queen comes back to the exact square that I said it should go to but that's not a threat okay now if white had played those two moves the other way around Threat, definitely. King goes to here. White misses a major threat and gets into a losing position. Okay, but let's just look at this now. Instead of bishop takes h6 and then queen there, let's play this. And let's say that here, white, sorry, black doesn't really notice. Then you've got boom. And that really is a boom. It's a big batter boom, right? Big bad boom. Okay, and the the pawn can't take. It won't even let me take. It's like, oh no, my king. Right. So black would have to play something like that. And then what? Then what will we do? Um, something like this. I'm going to grab a pawn. Well, I'm going to line up another rook here. And the pawn still can't capture. 
right? So maybe you might push this pawn, something like that. And then you go in with this. And black is lazy and thinks, ah, here, I'm going to take your rook. And you're like, whatever. Take the rook. I don't know, I'm just playing here. Okay, pawn recaptures. Oh no, my king only actually has one square to go to. I only have one square. Right? Check. Oh no. Oh, actually. Could have taken with the bishop there, couldn't they? Ah. But you, you see the difference. I mean, this is this is a, a, a big attacking opportunity for white, whereas what we had in the game was just the wrong way around, right? And you think about the difference between somebody, somebody playing around the 1,000 level, right, and somebody playing at the 1,500 level. It's those small differences like that. That's all it is. That's all it comes down to. So, Duke, I think you had a, a very solid game, um, and it all comes down to those small decisions, doesn't it? Okay, so there you go. Uh, I think that's been useful. Hope it's been useful for Thin White Duke 85. Hope it's been useful for you. Thank you for watching. I'll see you soon.